Um, this is a class that they asked Jim Bledsoe and I to do. They, they actually approached us last fall and asked us if we would consider doing this class. I guess by way of introduction, uh, there's some of you who may not have any idea who either one of us are. This is Jim right here in the, in the blue <laughs> shirt and vest. I'm Bob Sproles, and um, this marks the 25th, this month will mark the 25th year that Anita and I have been members here at Conestoga Valley. A little background, I had worked for IBM. We moved here from upstate in New York in 1998. I continued to work out of my house until 2010 uh, when I retired from IBM after 43 years. And then in 2003, uh, I became an elder here, uh, along with Bill Worrell, to work along with Jim and uh, Paul Tustin. And I was eld an elder for 17 years, stepped down about two years ago. So, Jim and I have not done a lot of note comparing, uh, just in generalities, uh, the kind of things that we want to talk about. Uh, but I will tell you that I had a dream last Monday night that, uh, well, this has been on my mind for some time, but I had a dream last Monday night that I was teaching this class and I fell asleep. <laughs> so I'm going to try my best to stay awake today and I, I hope you can do the same thing. Um, all of us have had learning experiences. Any one of you could stand up here and talk for quite some time about things you have learned in life. Uh, so what I thought I would do, I'm going to ask you this week to you think about that. And then next week, just come back with one thing that you've learned in life that you would like to share. So I had coffee with Jeff a couple of weeks ago and he said, well, you know, Bob, I kind of see this class as something that you and Jim would tell your grandchildren. And um, it's been quite a challenge, uh, so we're going to do, two, just so you know, we're going to do two Sundays. I'm going to do this Sunday and the next Sunday, and then Jim will take the next two Sundays. Um, so we haven't laid out an agenda. I'm going to talk about some things. He'll talk about some things maybe in a similar vein, uh, maybe a different thing because we have different experiences. So as I look back over life, uh, I've learned uh, through a lot of avenues. I've learned through failures that I've had. I've learned through disappointment. Uh, I've learned through personal experience. I've learned through health issues. Uh, I've learned uh, through interaction with friends. I've learned through teaching that I've heard. And I've learned by observation. And by that, <clears throat> all of us, I think, probably can relate to this. Sometimes you learn things from other people's experience. I saw somebody make this decision, that was not good, I don't want to do that. Or somebody was successful in this, I'll learn from that. So <clears throat> what I thought I would do, several years ago, a fellow decided he was on his 51st, 51st birthday. And he said, I think what I'm going to do in my advanced years of 51, I'm going to sit down and write down a list of things that I have learned. So he had did that one morning, and he was kind of astonished at the things he could identify that he learned. So the next week he did the same thing. And he said, you know, I have learned a lot, but I think what I'm going to do is expand this to other family members, other neighbors, friends, and ask people, regardless of what age they are, to share with me what they have learned. So this has been a book I've had in my library for some time. And so I'm going to share a few of these little gems from different age uh, groups. So some child, age six, said, I've learned that if you spread the peas out on your plate, it looks like you ate more. <laughs> a 13-year-old says, I just learned that when I get my room just the way I like it, mom makes me clean it up. This is a good one from a nine-year-old. I've learned that you can be in love with four girls at the same time. <laughs> I've learned that money 
is a lousy way to keep score. Would you agree with that? 78 years old. I've learned that the older I get, the more pretty girls I remember kissing as a young man. <laughs> I've learned that you can do something in an instant that will give you a heartache for life. Anybody identify with that? Well, we'll share some more of those later on. But we're, what I thought I would do is kind of start by saying I think all of us here today are products of the environment that we've been in through our life. Uh, where we were born, uh, what kind of parents we had, uh, how we were raised, what kind of education we've had, our jobs and careers, faith experiences. And Jim and I chatted about this briefly, and he may share some of this with you when he teaches in a couple of weeks. We have different family experiences. We have different cultural experiences. Our educations are different. Our work experiences are different. So when Jim gets up here in a couple of weeks, he will share some things with you that may be different. So what I want to do over the next couple of weeks is kind of share with you some lessons that Anita and I, and by the way, I forgot to mention, this is my wife Anita up here on the front row. Um, we've been married 60 years, so I want to share some of the things that have shaped us as who we are after this long time together. Um, I thought I'd kind of break this down in some categories. I want to sh share, share some general life lessons and some my faith experience, uh, things I've learned about marriage, things I've learned about parenting, things I've learned about church, and things I learned from being an elder. So that's a lot to pack in for the next couple of weeks, but we're going to try to do that. I was born in southern West Virginia, a small town called Bluefield. It was right in the uh, uh, heart of, right on the edge of, of the, what we would call the coal fields. I was born there in 1942. Uh, if for you history buffs, this was just six months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Of course, I was young. I don't remember any of those things. I do remember later on mom and dad talking about some of the difficulties it, they had in raising a family during the world and during the war. My dad was a blue-collar worker. He'd, he'd been a, a, a bus driver, a mechanic. <laughs> he could fix anything. Uh, very, very smart guy. Uh, had to quit gra school in the 10th grade because of the Depression. Uh, but dad was not much about going about church. My mom was a stay-at-home mom, and she was really the spiritual foundation of our family. <clears throat> so going back to that time, <clears throat> my very first church experience was since dad couldn't, wouldn't go, mother couldn't drive, we walked about five blocks to, I remember, I, I drove by it uh, some time back, Grace Methodist Church. So mom was insistent that all of us kids on Sunday morning would get up, we would get dressed, we would walk to church, we would go to Bible class, we would sit through the sermon. And I have some vivid memories of going to vacation Bible school there, probably in the second or third grade. And... Uh, <laughs> It's one of those things that just it just sticks in the back of your mind. In in uh, it was probably about 1950, and we went to vacation Bible school, and uh, they had all of us kids line up in a in in parade formation, and we walked around the block carrying the Christian flag, singing "Onward, Christian Soldiers." So I remember that just like it was yesterday, but Dad would not go to church. Uh, he just didn't want anything to do with it, but mom was insistent that the kids were going to go to church on Sunday. But later on, 1952, they made a decision that impacted us the rest of our lives, and that was they decided to move out of town, out into a little, I would call it in the country, but it had four acres. And so we moved out there and we started going to a different church, and it was Calfee Memorial Christian Church. So we started going there in 1952. They had a new preacher. His name was Harold No, And he was still, I think, a junior in, uh, in Bible college. But he would come up on weekends 
and teach and preach uh, uh, for us at church. But he was an amazing guy. He had an amazing ability to just simply talk about the gospel, explain the scriptures in a, in a very easy, understandable way. And lo and behold, uh, my dad decided, I think I'm going to start going to church with the family. Uh, so this was in 1952. And on Easter Sunday in 1953, my dad, who was 43, my brother Ralph, who was 16, and myself, I was 10, were all baptized on Easter Sunday. Ralph really had an affinity for this minister, and they got along great. So Ralph, uh, at, at about, about that age, maybe about 17, felt this calling to go into the ministry. So he did he end up going to Johnson Bible College in uh, near Knoxville, Tennessee. Not because he's my brother, but he's been an amazing preacher and, and teacher. And he just retired uh, last year at the age of 87. And uh, he's still a great guy. And we talk every two or three weeks. And every time I talk to him, he said, <clears throat> I got this great sermon idea. Well, he's not preaching anymore. But he said, if somebody wants me to, I'm ready. <laughs> he says, my mind works in sermonics, he says. Um, so that's a little bit of our background. But then, in 1958 another family moved into town, and that was Anita's family. Her family had lived down in the coal fields. Her dad had, was working for the railroad, and she can tell you some stories about growing up in the coal fields of West Virginia. So they moved up, and they started coming to the same church. And I think it was probably one of the first Sundays you were there. She had, she and her, she had two sisters, her mom and dad, and... Um, I saw her in Bible class, and I thought she was gorgeous, and I still think she's gorgeous. So from that time on, uh, we, had, we had a relationship. We became boyfriend, girlfriend. Uh, she was in junior high. Uh, I think I was a very mature high schooler. Um, but interestingly enough, shortly after that, my brother, who had gone to Bible college, and they graduated now, came back. In the, in the Christian church, they called them revival meetings. In, the, in this church, they would call them a gospel meeting. He came back and held a revival. And at that revival, Anita and her sister and her father were baptized by my brother. Uh, very interesting stories. And we have a picture. We've been doing some genealogy work. And we ran across a picture of her mother being baptized in a river down in the coal fields uh, a few years before that. Doing some of this genealogy work, I ran across a picture of my grandfather on my mother's side who did the groundbreaking of that church in the 40s before it was ever built. So our family has a long tie to that church going all the way back to, to my grandfather. So I tell you those things to tell you that Anita and I both were raised in Christian families. And it gave us a strong foundation for our own marriage and it taught us lessons that we also tried to pass on to our own children. And we're thrilled and blessed today to say that uh, our sons and their wives and all of their children are Christians. So the first lesson that I've learned when I was thinking back over my life is the importance of Christian families. The importance of Christian families. I know many of you did not have that same experience but I would tell you, if you're a parent today, you need to put the effort in to raising your children in a Christian environment. Um, so that family experience gave me a good moral foundation. So I decided in 1960, I graduated from high school, thought I was going to go to West Virginia University to become a forest ranger. I still don't know how this, I know how it happened. I don't know when I look back over this if God had a hand in this. <clears throat> but I, I'm, I'm <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> changed my mind and I've been reading about electronics. So I decided rather than become a forest ranger, I think I'll go to school to get into electronics. So I went to a two year technical school, Kansas City, got an associate degree in electronics and it changed my life as far as careers are concerned. But my upbringing had helped me establish what I call moral guardrails. All of us need moral guardrails. 
especially at a very young age, you need to do that. <clears throat> so I graduated from college, came back, Anita and I got married in 1962. I had gotten a job in Kansas City, so we headed back there. And <clears throat> I tell you that to say we've always been involved in church. We were reminiscing just this week, <clears throat> excuse me, about we went to church. I had been attending a Christian church when I was in, in college. We came back and we went and I, we were just trying to remember the name of it. It was at 38th and Baltimore Christian Church. We lived right beside the church. But Anita was, she reminded me the other night that the first Sunday we were there, one of the first Sundays with our young married couple, 20 and 18, and a young family said, well, it's so nice to have you. Could we take you to lunch? And we thought, what a nice gesture. And they took us to lunch and we got through. The man didn't have enough money to pay the bill. <coughs> So we had to pitch in and help this guy buy, uh, buy our lunch. So uh, after that, we changed churches. We kind of moved, and we went to a church called Stony Point Christian Church. It was a wonderful, wonderful church. Some great, great people. I learned so much from people at that church. Um, but then in 1975, <clears throat> the church had this vision that the county was growing and that they wanted to plant a church a little further out in the county, so it was maybe 10 miles away from the church. So Anita and I, Steve was uh, probably in 75, about 11 or 12 years old, along with a small group of other people, went and started meeting in a high school auditorium. Uh, and we would haul in the communion every week, and we'd haul the communion out every week. Um, and so we helped plant a church in 1975. Then in 1978, I, I worked for IBM. I had an opportunity to take a move to upstate New York. And uh, so we moved to upstate New York, and uh, we started uh, attending another church. But I will say that Steve and I and our son David were in Kansas City in November. The, the guys took me out for a Kansas City Chiefs game, and we got to go to that church that we helped establish in 1978. And it was thrilling to see, I, I mean, they've, they've got a building, a wonderful preacher, the church is thriving, and uh, it was good for us to go back and see the work that we were involved in in 1975 has continued to flourish, and there's still a congregation there. So we moved to upstate New York, and we were looking for what I will call a restoration church, and if you don't know much about the upper part of the Northeast, there just aren't very many. Uh, but we went to a church that was called <coughs> Union Center Christian Church. And uh, it wasn't long after we were there that I realized they had Christian Church on the door, but a lot of their practices were not what I would consider uh, in tune with restoration uh, uh, teaching. So then we ended up looking for another church, and we ended up going to Inwell Church of Christ. It was a non-instrumental church. I, f I forgot to mention, when we were all the time up to this point, we've grown up in an instrumental background. Uh, grew up um, uh, piano and organ is what we grew up with. My mom and my sister sang in the choir. And when I came to uh, the Church of Christ, of course, you don't have pianos, you don't have organs, you don't have choirs. Uh, so that, that took some adjustment. Um, so I tell you all of that, and then we moved here in 1998, and as I mentioned, we've been here at CV now for 25 years. So I tell you all of that to say, if there's one thing that I've learned, and I'll talk more about that, I'll probably get to it next week, don't give up on church. We've been to some wonderful churches, we've been to some okay churches, we've been to some mediocre churches, but we never stop going. Always went, always got something out of that in some way that helped us in our faith. And I know people leave, we've seen that, we've seen the numbers, you see it, uh, people have left churches for lots of different reasons. So the thing I would tell you is don't give up going to church. You've got to stay connected. And I'll talk more about that when I talk about some church experiences. One of the other great lessons I've learned in life, I was thinking back over this is how truly blessed I have been in my life. Um, several years ago, uh, somebody gave me this piece of advice. 
Don't compare yourselves to those who have more than you do. Compare yourself to the millions who have less than you do. You know, there's some 8 billion people on this planet right now. And, and I would tell you that the large majority of that 8 billion people would change places with any one of us in this room in an instant. I'm 80 years old. I've never gone to bed hungry. I've never been without clothing. I've never been without shelter. I've never been without health care. I've never been persecuted because of what I believe. So we, uh, Nita and I talk about this. We, we watch the news on occasion, and at night, quite often when we're saying our nightly prayers, we thank God for that, and we pray for these people in Ukraine. We pray for these people in Syria and Turkey. We pray for these migrants at the border. All of them would do anything to have what we have. We thank God that we have a warm bed to sleep in. Our tummies are full. And we thank God for that. And the other things I will tell you that we pray about is we, <clears throat> we have been so blessed, we ask God to help us be good stewards of what He's entrusted to us. If we have any money, help us to use it in a way that would glorify you. So we have tried to live a, a life of gratitude, uh, but I just realized how blessed I have been. Um, Jeff preached a sermon, it's been a few weeks back, and he made a comment that kind of stuck with me. We should all try to consider living our lives backwards. And I thought about that, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a quite, a, quite a probing statement. Um, if we think, and we all know that eventually we're all going to pass from this life some way or the other, then what? If we believe that there's something eternal beyond that, we need to be taking steps before that to be prepared for that. So, if we believe that there's more to life than living, earning a living, and dying, then we need to be prepared for those things that are afterwards. Um, so, thinking back over that, over the years I've looked at decisions that I've made, other people have made, you may come up with a different list of people or a different list of questions, but I have kind of boiled this down to three questions that I think are the most important decisions that you'll have to make in life. And I'm going to tell you the questions and then I'll talk a little bit about each one of them. The very first question I think every human being has to decide, what do I do about God? What do I do about God? The second one is, should I marry? And if so, whom should I marry? And the third one is, should, if you decide to get married, should we have children? And if so, how many? I'm sure all of you are sitting there maybe thinking about those three questions, and I think you would probably agree that those three decisions can have a tremendous impact on you for the rest of your life. So, what do I do about God? Uh, the book of Ecclesiastes said he's made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. The way I interpret that is in the heart of every person, I believe there's some idea that there's an eternity somewhere. So it's in the hearts of man to think about an eternity. So if that's the case, if we believe that, what do we do? We can go out and we can see the great things that God has created around us. It's just, it's just amazed at creation. Uh, all of the things you see, how everything in the universe just works so precisely. How our human bodies are designed, how it functions day to day. You've got to come to some conclusion, at least I have, that that was not by an accident. God has designed those things. So if I believe that there's a God who's done that, how do I respond? I hear people say, oh, I believe in God. But you never see any evidence in their life that they're trying to do anything to follow Him. Oh, I believe in a God. But they have not done anything to demonstrate that. Um, so in my case, as I just related to you, I was taught from a very young age about God. 
I was taught about Jesus Christ. I was taught about the importance of having a faith. So that decision, I made that decision because it was implanted in me at a very early age. The next question, I think, is should I marry, and if so, whom should I marry? I know a few people in my life who have chosen to remain single, and they've lived perfectly happy and normal lives. But a lot of us start thinking about that and say, I think that maybe it would be best if I be married. So if that's the case, how do you go about choosing a spouse? How do you go about doing that? And I'm sure all of you in here who are married or have been would, could tell me a story about how you met your spouse and, and wonderful stories. Um, but I talked about the faith of my mother. My mother was a, a, a praying woman. And she taught me very early, and probably when I was getting into junior high school, that I should be praying about who I was going to marry. Um, she prayed about that. She taught me to pray about that. She was also the one that told me I should not be having sex until I got married. Uh, it was my mother who did those things. So I told you about meeting Anita at church. Uh, so I believe Anita was God's answer to my mother's prayers and mine about finding a spouse. Uh, I will also tell you that we, from very early on, we, uh, about our two sons, that we prayed for Stephen and David. Steve, I guess. <laughs> I don't call him Stephen very often. Uh, uh, but Steve and David, we prayed that God would lead them to godly women. We prayed the same things for our grandchildren. We have a two, almost a two-year-old great-granddaughter. We're already praying, and I know her family is praying, that God will lead that little girl to a godly man at some point in time. So, the advice I would give you about that, if you have kids, especially uh, adolescent kids, you need to be praying that with your children, and you need to have them praying about, God, lead me to the person that you want me to marry. Um, so uh, that, uh, I think, is a, a second major in, uh, decision. And then if you get married, should we have children? Uh, we have friends. Uh, we, uh, we've known people that have, that have been married that chose chosen not to have kids. Um, we had decided pretty much when we got married, we talked about it, and we, we, we thought we'd like to have a, a couple of children. Steve was born in 1964. And then we experienced two miscarriages. I don't know how many of you might have had a miscarriage in your, in your, in your marriage, but if, if you have, you know how devastating those can be. Uh, you're, all, you're all pumped up about maybe bringing a new child into life, and then for whatever reason, that doesn't materialize. But we continued to place that before God. It took six years. Uh, took six years, but we were blessed with our second son. And we've often thought about those miscarriages um, and said if they hadn't have happened, would we have had our son David? Don't know. And the other thing too, I will tell you, Anita and I have talked about this. Uh, we're, we're reading another book that has to do with, and I, and I think you'll hear more about that later on in the year, about people who had near-death experiences. And we've often wondered, do you think that those two miscarriages, do you think there was a child there that we might see if we get to heaven? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but anyway, it took, it took six years, but God was gracious to us and, and gave us our second son. Both of our boys, not because Steve's in the room, but both of the boys have been wonderful sons. Uh, and they, too, decided to have two children. Now, on the other hand, we have a neighbor behind us who just had their tenth. Yikes! <laughs> Ten children. Um, so the reason I believe deciding to have children is so important uh, is 
they're a huge responsibility. They cost a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> I spent a fortune on sneakers alone over our two boys. Um, and I think today you really have to consider how are you going to educate them? Uh, my own view, it's, it's very di not impossible, but it's very difficult to get ahead in this world today without some kind of formal college education. It's, there are exceptions to that, but that's the general rule. And we all know how expensive colleges are. So if you're going to bring some children into this world, how do you plan to provide for them? It's your responsibility. Um, and another thing that you need to think about is you're not just bringing a physical baby into this world. You're, if, if what we read about uh, creation and, and, and uh, child, uh, children and so forth, you're bringing an eternal soul into this world. And that soul is going to spend an eternity somewhere. So if you're going to bring a child into this life, you need to understand that you have the responsibility to guide them um, spiritually. It's not just the physical thing. You need to provide them with the spiritual education. So I believe those three decisions are ones that are, you really have, have to get right. Have to get right. So I'm happy to say that I've been blessed in those decisions, but it goes all the way back to my spiritual upbringing. I was taught about those things. Um, talk a little bit about my faith. Um, <clears throat> tell me what you think about this statement. What you believe defines who you are and how you live. What you believe defines who you are and how you live. Do you believe that's true? Absolutely. You want to elaborate on that at all? Your thoughts? You want to elaborate on that at all? No, I, I, <coughs> I mean, the way you phrased it is just so true. I mean, because many times you, saw, you see people and you yourself will do things and you'll, you'll be surprised at people's reaction and you'll be surprised at some of their action. But when you get back to the real core, that's who you are. That's what you believe and that's what you act on. And we many times want to blame somebody else or blame something else. It's who we are that determines what we do. And many times we don't want to even admit that that's what's going on. We sometimes like to say, well, I did this because. No, it's all in you. And the more you start to read scripture, you see that whatever you are comes from within you. And you can't blame anybody else. Yep, I agree. Anybody else have a comment on that statement? I do. Okay. I believe that you can let outside influences Still your choice. I know it's still your choice, but you can let outside influences <coughs> what um, cause you or poison your mind, however you want to word that to do something. And then later you realize, hey, that's not right. I need to, I need, I need to work on that and, and not let that control me because I don't like what I just did. Can I? Sure, go ahead. And I agree with what you're saying because all of us are influenced by other people, and we sometimes, like you say don't necessarily recognize the influence of that pressure, but when you really reflect on it quietly, by yourself, with God, you recognize it is you. But sometimes you don't like that, so <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna do that again. I'm gonna learn from that. I let what that person okay. said influence yeah. my action. I acted out on what, what I heard, and I shouldn't do that. Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. <laughs> That's more common than some of the other things that we say. <laughs> yep. I agree. <clears throat> so I believe, that, I believe that's true. What you believe is going to determine who you are and how you live. 
Uh, and based upon that, I talked a little bit about my upbringing. I found a picture again in some of the genealogy pictures I was looking for of a picture of my mother reading the Bible to my sister and I. I think I was probably in my underwear, about 10 year old, was getting ready for bed, and mom sitting there reading the Bible to us kids. Uh, so the thing I have learned, and I'm still continuing to learn it, is the importance of reading the Bible on a regular basis because I think it's got to become the cornerstone of our faith. We're bombarded with so many things, so many avenues or things that are counter to what the Bible teaches. Um, so there's a few scriptures that I've, I've kind of claimed, I suppose would be the word. One of them is, is Psalms 119, 11 through 16 that says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. How is he going to do that if we never read the Bible? I attended a seminar several years ago. It's back in the 70s. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Bill Gothard. <clears throat> he used to teach a uh, seminar called uh, Base, uh, Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts. Thanks, hon. And they, they gave us a scripture that I had probably read and never had really related to. And I, I don't know if you have your Bibles, but it's Proverbs 30, verses 8 and 9. <clears throat> and it says, um, actually 7, 8, and 9, it says, Two things I ask of you, O Lord, do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, Who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. So that's always been kind of something that Anita and I have claimed. Just give us our daily bread. If you get too much, you start saying, Look what I've accumulated. But I don't want to get to the point that I'm so destitute that I have to steal to provide for my children. So that's a passage that, that I have used many, many times. Somebody, somebody asked me, once, what's one of your favorite passages of Scripture? It's Proverbs 30, verse 8 and 9. And another one, <clears throat> I won't go to this one, but in 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 through 12 says, make, your make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. I've read the Bible for, <clears throat> for many years, and what I'm learning about myself is I don't remember it. I don't remember things. I, I forget, um, which is the reason I need to remember it. Um, I look and read through the Old Testament and see how the, <clears throat> how the Jews were and the way that God dealt with them. And they would praise Him and praise Him and we will never leave you, O oh God. You are God forever for a week or so. And the next thing you know, God says, they've turned their back on me. Uh, they are stiff-necked people. I'm a stiff-necked person. And so... <clears throat> How am I ever going to get better if I'm not being reinforced by what the Bible tells me? I'm reminded of what Paul writes in Romans 7. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had said, You shall not covet. How do I know what my life is supposed to be like if I don't read these scriptures? Uh, I need to be reminded on a regular basis how I'm supposed to live. I need to read Jesus' teachings on forgiveness if I'm going to be a forgiving person. I need to read what James says about the tongue if I'm going to control my tongue. I need to read what Paul says about sexual purity and faithfulness in marriage. I also need to be reminded of the many wonderful promises that God has given to His people 
who remain faithful until the end. It's easy to get discouraged in this world. It really is. But I need to be reminded that there are greater things in store for me if I remain faithful. I need to be reminded of those things. Uh, from a personal point of view, my own, re, uh, um, own practices is I alternate between the Old Testament and New Testament. I make a point of reading all four Gospels every year. If you don't read anything else, sit down and read the Gospels and just see the amazing story that's told there, the amazing things that Jesus did. I don't sit down and read for hours. I read two to three chapters at a time, and then I try to meditate on those things. I just finished Luke last week, uh, first part of the week, and just going back and reading again, Jesus last week. Uh, it's just powerful. I also refer to Colossians 3 quite often. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Um, simply call the rules for holy living. The rules for holy living. So it says this, Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your, is your life, appears, then you will appear with Him in glory. So therefore, put to death, therefore, whatever belong, belongs to your earthly nature, your sexual immorality, impurity, lusts, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry, because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. There is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe, your, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. How can you not read that and come to the understanding that you need to live a life different than you used to live? Um, so one thing I would ask you to do, I, uh, I, was, I was going to, I'm not going to do that today. Well, maybe I will. I don't know if you're a Bible student. I think everybody should use a, a, a study Bible. This is a Bible that i bought probably 20 years ago. It's a great study Bible, and it's described as a kind of a Bible that comes out of a press conference, and that means there's some teaching, and then there's questions uh, in the side uh, of, of each column. So what, what did Jesus say when he, or mean when he say this, or what was this referring to? So uh, I use this a lot when I'm especially getting into the Old Testament and reading things. Well, what's the story behind that? This has got a lot of, a lot of good study helps in it. So I would encourage you, the lesson, one of the lessons I've learned is you need to be, you need to be steady Bible readers. I was just talking to my brother Ralph last week about this, and uh, he's, he gets up early. He's, he's up at 5.30 in the morning. His wife doesn't get up until later. He says, so in the first Two or three hours of the morning is when my brain is fresh. That's when I do my reading and study. And we talked about Bible readings. You got to read it every day. Here's a guy who's been teaching Bible all of his life. You got to read it every day because we are forgetful people. And the further you get away from it, the easier it is to get away from it. So um, we've only got a couple minutes. We'll pick up there next week, and I want to talk a little bit about. Uh, what prayer has meant uh, in our lives uh, together. So thank you for being here today. Any comments before we wrap up? And remember, think about, come back next week and be prepared to say, here's one thing I've learned in my life. It's, uh, it's, it's a challenging task. It's probably one of the hardest lessons I've ever had to prepare for. 
sit down in 90, uh, sit down in, in two 45 minute sessions and convey to people what you've learned in life. So, all right, thank you very much. We'll see you next week. One question. Yes. Mm -hmm. This one, oh, this is called Live and Learn and Pass It On. Yeah. Yeah, there's some cute stories in here. Uh, one of them is a little boy says, I, a little boy five years old said, I found out you cannot hide, hide broccoli in a glass of milk. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see you next week. <clears throat> Thank you. You're welcome.